I want to start out by thanking Don Sawyer and the Phyllis Risk Center for really making stories that we do in the media endure longer, keeping the issues on the front burner, um, and, and continuing the conversation and, the, and, and, and bringing home the relevance of some of these issues. And uh, you've done a fantastic job, and thank you for inviting me to, to be here today. My name is Fred Sam Lazaro. Um, as John mentioned, I'm mostly associated with the News Hour. Um, have been there since it was called the McNeil Lara News Hour, uh, which was a long time ago. Um, we've done a host of stories about water and issues related to water. And if you'd like to watch more of them, undertoldstories.org, which is the organization um, that I belong to at St. Mary's University, undertoldstories.org has um, has all of these stories aggregated, as does PBS NewsHour or newshour.pbs.org. And the NewsHour, um, similarly, is one of the last places in the mainstream media, that uh, mainstream broadcast media for sure, that has really devoted itself um, to covering issues like this, to pay attention to the issues in the global south, and notably issues related to water. The film you watch, the, sh the short uh, report, is from South Asia, which is an area that faces a whole host of issues related to water. What will climate change do to glacier melt, and how is that going to impact the rivers that flow uh, down into Pakistan and India and indeed Bangladesh um, in, in, in a uh, climate that is changing? Um, the India-Pakistan Indus Water Treaty, which has endured quite well until now, but faces a serious challenge in the wake of dam building by <laughs> India um, on rivers that feed the agricultural regions of both these countries. All of this, of course, is unfolding in the explosive region of Kashmir, which makes it a cause, which has made it a cause celeb for um, militant groups uh, in the region. Water is at the center of uh, a new cause, basically, as if we needed a new cause for militancy in the region. We also have done stories, and another major issue in the region is the lack of any coherent water policy, which has led to profligate wastage of water in the agricultural regions of both Pakistan and India in the Punjab, which really imperils the aquifers that feed the farmland that feed more than a billion people. Those are all major issues. But in this film, you won't see many of these issues touched on. And it's a classic example of how the news imperative um, takes priority. We were in, in Pakistan in December, and that was, as you might recall, just about three months after epic floods in the region that, that, that devastated a huge chunk of the country. And it, just impressive to see how enduring the impact of those floods um, still is actually right to this day. And the news hour most under, quite understandably wanted to know what was happening with the flood update. This film took us not to really where the flood was unfolding, but rather to um, the tribal areas, which is, we thought, a good undertold story. Um, always facing the dilemma we are in our media, um, in, in, in my approach as a, as a beat reporter, of feeling sort of like a butterfly that flutters over many different flowers and doesn't settle to pollinate any single one. And it's something that we live with constantly. And it's really thanks to, to organizations like, uh, like the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, like NewsHour.org, where we're able to now bring all of these issues together in, in web portals and, and discuss them wholly. More than five months after floods swamped Pakistan, the process of recovery is barely beginning. We have a report from Sindh province by special correspondent Fred de Sam Lazaro. Vast swaths of Pakistan's southern Sindh province remain inundated, in some places under 10 feet of water. By official estimates, half a million people are still in tent camps. An occasional farmer can be seen sowing the land but the land is nowhere near ready to grow food, says the government's top advisor on water and agriculture issues. The ability of the land to soak up that water 
uh, is not there anymore. It's not a sponge anymore. The sponge is loaded. And on top of which we are in the winter season, so our evaporation rates have gone down. Kamal Majidullah says it's just one of the challenges that will slow the recovery from floods that blanketed almost all corners of Pakistan. A lack of international aid is another, which he blames on what he calls Pakistan's distorted image as a refuge for terrorists. We needed $10 billion to start with. The effect of the damage is something within the region of 50. Um, we haven't even got close to 10. And I think that fair bit of that has to do with the kind of coverage Pakistan gets around the world, which is sadly um, quite untrue, because you can't sort of take specific little areas where a conflagration is taking place. And it's a serious conflagration, and it needs to be eradicated, no question about it. But there are 180 other million people living here. Ironically, even within Pakistan, there's an image problem that slowed aid to the regions associated with militancy and conflict. We traveled to the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, along the Afghan border, thought to be a haven for Taliban militants who've been targets of the Pakistani military and U.S. drones. Like most of the northern areas of the flood zone, the waters have receded here, but much of the farmland is still smothered under up to five feet of silt. These farmers say people are down to selling what little assets they have, like livestock that survived the flood. Initially, some groups did come with rations and food, but after a while they disappeared. One of the reasons is the location of this area is tribal troubled, so people are not very willing to come and work in these parts. Although extremists do live in this area, local aid worker Maksud Alam says they've caused no trouble after the flood. I have been working in this district for the last four months, but I haven't seen any uh, kind of trouble with any organization. But people in normal sort of aid agencies are very reluctant to come here because of the history of militancy. Is that true? Yeah, strategically, I mean, strategically, uh, it is placed at such a junction. Of, of these tribal agencies. But nobody dares to come to this part. I mean, that is, uh, you are right, I think. Alam works for a quasi-government agency, one of few aid groups working here. With a grant from the New York-based Open Society Institute, they've begun to restore the farmland and also irrigation canals, which were washed away. 95% of the families here are without their only source of income, he says, and it will be a while before they'll harvest a crop. How many people are you talking about totally? How many families? Probably uh, 500 in this area alone. And the surrounding area put together, probably uh, it comes to more than uh, half a million. Half a million families? Farm families that have uh, subsistence uh, kind of uh, from agriculture land holdings. They have lost their source of income generation. Outside of the main areas of conflict in Khyber Pakhtunwa province, life is marginally better. Kala Khan is a bit farther ahead in rebuilding his livelihood, a bit. He received a $220 grant from the government, along with some seeds and fertilizer from a private Pakistani aid group to replant the one and a half acres he rents to grow wheat and this fast-growing animal fodder. But he also borrowed about $2,000, twice this family's annual income from neighbors and relatives to help rebuild the simple dwelling that houses an extended family of 10. It's far from done. This is where my wife and I used to sleep. It was completely destroyed. For now, his wife shares a finished room with their two daughters. Next door, he shares this space with the family's prized possession, a water buffalo. My biggest burden is to pay back that loan. Our biggest expense is food and rations. It would be easier if we got more rations. We have to decide how much to spend on living, how much to pay back. After all, my stomach is important. My children's stomach is important. It will take some time. Spartan as life seems, Khan says he's better off than many others.
I saw on TV that some places, the floods were so drastic, not only did people's crops and homes get washed away, but also their children. So I'm thankful to God for sparing our lives. Our buffalo were safe. Okay, our crops will come back, but there are people who've lost a lot more. For these worst affected flood victims, most in the downstream Sindh province, life will likely remain on hold for several months, even years. Simi Kamal is a water policy expert and activist. I think the problems that, uh, are, uh, that we have to deal with are basically over the next year or two, really to help these people get back on the land, um, help them uh, stay away from, from diseases as much as they can, uh, help them with their own food needs, help get the kids back to school, you know, help them get over this winter. And ironically, amid all this flooding, Kamal says Pakistan actually faces a water shortage over the long term, thanks to inefficient use of groundwater on its farmland and the prospect of disappearing Himalayan glaciers that feed this country's rivers. At stake is not just the fresh water supply, she says, but the very food security of this large, complex nation. Fred's report was a partnership with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting and the Untold Stories Project at St. Mary's University in Minnesota.